Last week uh, was uh, our third week in a series, and this is a Mac Hammond 10 minute style review. Uh, we've done, this is number four. I'm going to paraphrase this. This is where God says, if you don't forgive others, I won't forgive you. We talked about this last week. Jesus said it. If you don't forgive others, I'm not forgiving you. We pointed out that Jesus had not died, given his blood as a sacrifice at that time that he was speaking these words. We pointed out that in regards to the new covenant, the covenant we are in right now as Christians, the dispensation of grace, it doesn't work that way. And you're in trouble if you believe that. If you really believe that statement, we pointed out that any of those things that you hear Jesus saying, things like you can commit adultery by just thinking about it long enough, he was saying to the Pharisees because they had adjusted the Ten Commandments and the Old Covenant to where they believed, and they were all men, there were no women Pharisees, that they could look at a woman, think adulterous thoughts with her, but as long as you did not commit the act, that was okay. Jesus was telling them, you're wrong. You have adjusted the law so that you are able to follow it to where you think you're keeping it, but you're breaking the Ten Commandments just thinking about a woman too long and letting it get into your heart. That's what he's telling the the Pharisees, the preachers of the day. Numerous other examples we gave, and we pointed to something we covered in the second week, which was the actual new covenant, the actual covenant that you are supposed to be in. It's rarely preached. It's twice in Hebrews. It's again in the Old Testament. And basically, it's saying, what it's saying is you have the ability to have a deep in intuitive relationship with God from within you. See, they didn't have that in the Old Testament. They spoke through a priest or a prophet. God used, right. they didn't have that connection. They didn't get to experience that. But, he, but he's not gonna do that for you because apparently because of the words of Jesus, right? And apparently we contrast what Jesus was saying in Mark eleven twenty six. If you don't forgive others, God will not forgive you to that extent. That's what Jesus said. All right? Jesus was not speaking to Christians. At that point, he was not. I, if I'm down here, I'm not allowed to, to walk past the poles. Does it look bad over here? That's what they told me. I, they didn't tell me if I'm on stage. They didn't walk past the poles. Does it look bad? Oh, it gets dark, doesn't it? That's what they mean? Okay. They didn't know I would test it. <laughs> All right. Suit doesn't button very easily. I want to welcome you back to church. Thank God God sent you a laborer, okay? Maybe it was your sister. Right. Right. <laughs> she knows I'm kidding. Listen, Jesus was not speaking to Christians. The writer of Hebrews was speaking to Jews that had Jesus in their hearts. Therefore, speaking to the church, that would be us. The new covenant cannot happen for you. You can never know God intuitively unless you believe Hebrews 8, 12, which starts with the word for. All the things on top of that, you can have. That means because you believe this verse, which contrasts what Jesus says. It says, your sins and iniquities, I'm going to have mercy on. And your lawless, Hebrews 8, 12, is it up there? And your lawless deeds of unrighteousness, I'll remember no more. Or you can flip them. Amplified flips them. Well, how if Jesus is telling us the amount that you forgive someone and you can't forgive them, God's not forgiving you. That's wrong. It's old covenant preaching. Jesus had not died. He had not died. We pointed out the fact that God is not confused. He's not trying to confuse us. You have to pay attention to who he's talking to. Who he's talking to. Jesus is talking to. He told, also said we should go poke our eyes out and cut off our hands if we can't control our, uh, what we're looking at. Or if we're stealing, well, let's do everything he says. Let's do everything he says then. But we pick and choose. If you're going to try to put everything Jesus said under our covenant, you have to remember in the Gospels, in approximately 97% of Mark, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Jesus had not died, there were no Christians, and it was all still old covenant. He was known as a preacher of the law. So you have to keep that in mind, who he's talking to. There was no new covenant when Jesus lived. He taught principles of the new covenant, i.e., uh, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his 
righteousness. Not yours. Seek first his. We hit the Lord's prayer last week. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Remember the disciples asked him, uh, uh, how do we pray for this time? Well, his kingdom's already come. You know when his kingdom came? It came in Acts when the Holy Spirit came. So Jesus is saying, right now, pray for his kingdom to come. Well, the kingdom already came. You don't need to pray that. Right, right. Thy will be done. Thy, his, God's will was done when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane. He said, Lord, not my will, but your will. His will was done when he went to the cross. So that's a waste of time to say, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. On earth as it is in heaven, that's already been done. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Remember, you have to look at the time frame. It's a different, different dispensation. He was telling the disciples how to pray two years before his death. He hadn't gone to the cross. He hadn't given his blood. He hadn't been a sacrifice for you. What about uh, he'll forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those trespasses against us. That's how I learned it. Oh, so you're praying for God to treat you like you treat other people? Go ahead. Go, you go ahead and do that. You tell me how that works for you, okay? Because you don't know what you, then you, that, that means you perish for a lack of knowledge, right? That's what the Bible means because we got half the denominations in America praying the Lord's Prayer this morning. There's a lot better prayers to pray. You know, when, when, let's just say, let's say that was true, that God is only going to forgive you as you're in the process of forgiving someone else. Okay? Let's say that's going on. All right, you think about it. Think about it. Like, say, so, so I'm going through this person I, let's say I've blown up on this person because they offended me. I confronted them for something they said, right? And I blew up. And, but now I got to the point where I just don't glare at them. I'm not blowing up at them. I'm actually praying for them. But I have a little bit of fear that if I see them, I'll say, I'll, I'll say what I want to say. So I, 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 try not, I try to avoid them. But God sees that I'm, I'm trying to forgive them, Right? But I have fear to talk to them because I'm afraid of what I'm going to say. Perfect love casts out fear. So if you have any fear, that is to the extent that you, you don't have a revelation of Jesus. Because love would cast that fear out. Do you hear me? When I see them, I don't feel Christian love. You know, there's, you know, going on. And that's everything I can do to, that, 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 not to confront them, but I'm getting little victories because I'm not blowing up in them, I'm not talking bad about them, and I'm praying for them. But I haven't forgiven them. So you're going to tell me, through that time that I'm struggling but trying, that God is just going to give me a little forgiveness all the way through. Right? That's what was taught in the 80s. The Bible's very clear. You know, the, the, the Lord didn't name the Lord's Prayer the Lord's Prayer. You're aware of that? 12-minute review. Now that we have finished the review, praise God, let's go to 1 Corinthians 15, 3, and 4. For I delivered to you as of first importance... What I also received, pay attention. What's the first importance? This is the only time it caused anything of first importance. You have to pay attention to letters, or excuse me, orders and numbers, orders of things and numbers in the Bible. This is the first importance. It's really the only importance. If you don't have this importance, you don't get anything else that Christ died for your sins. And then he goes to the, the, the death, burial, and resurrection. This is the first importance. This is the Holy Spirit trying, saying through the Apostle Paul, um, it, it's the Holy Spirit's perception what should be looked at first. The King James says, first of all. We're going out of the, the, the English version. What is it? The New English. Because when you say first of all, you could be thinking Oh, this is the first thing I'm going to say, but the English standard got the actual Greek right. It means number one importance. 
number one importance of all the truth that is touched through God's word that he gives us, you can focus on the first importance as the forgiveness of sins because we just read it. You have to pay attention to the numbers and you have to pay attention to the order of things. I would think that if you're sick in your body and you want healing, the Bible might be hinting to you to study the forgiveness of sins. And just like the verse says, his death, burial, and resurrection, because it's called a first importance. I feel like you're, if you're always lacking in your life, always coming up short, if you need a touch from God, or what Mark Hankins called in a sermon, a pop from God. Remember his microwave popcorn? It seems like that with God sometimes. You put the microwave popcorn in, and you just wait for like two minutes. And nothing happens. And it seems like that with God sometimes. And then you get a one pop. And you finally get the pop. Oh, yes, I didn't need to turn the bag over. It's not burning. And then what happens after the one pop? Boom, 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 Right? I'm saying sometimes you just need a positive pop from God. I remember my son one time losing probably the second or third biggest game um, in his high school career. If you play basketball that long, you, you, win, you win them and you lose them. And, uh, and his team had just lost this huge game. I said to him, you got to get over it. And he said with tears in his eyes, I just need a pop from God. Do you need a pop from God? Well, you can get it a lot of ways, and we've just forgotten. If you need a pop from God, I feel as if the Holy Spirit is trying to tell you something when he's talking about what's of first importance. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, for I've delivered to you as of first importance what I've also received, that Christ died for our sins. First importance. There are many things to focus on in the Bible, but what is of first importance is the forgiveness of sins, the death, burial, and resurrection. And when you really believe that Christ died for your sins and you know you're forgiven at all times, I believe that something happens in the lives of Christians that stay focused on their forgiveness and not broken fellowship with God, which unfortunately we hear preached all over the world today. I don't have time to explain it, but I preaching that says you fall out of the gift of righteousness every time you sin. God's not hearing you. Oh, when you worry, when you overeat, when you do anything out of faith. I should just start walking on my toes. So I just walk on my toes. Do anything out of faith. I don't know why I'm doing this. Okay. <laughs> Wake up. All right. <laughs> just kidding. Sleep all you want. It'll get in doesn't bother me. Listen. You sin, you're telling me every time you worry, every time you have fear, every time you overeat, every time, every time you, you, you think about something too long, every time you, you doubt that's not of faith, everything of not of faith is a sin, and you're going to fall out of righteousness, so you're going to walk, you better walk around confessing them all then, all day. That's what was preached in the 80s, and it's wrong. You're forgiven. Past, present, future. It's called a gift. It's a gift that he doesn't take back. If you've not heard of any of the first three of these, I spent a lot of time proving through the scripture that you do not fall out of the righteousness of God or how he views you when you sin under the new covenant. I would debate that with any scholar all day. He could be Dr. So-and-so if you skip with the scriptures, and I would win it all day. And I'm not a scholar. Too many Christians are still counting on the fact that they come up short in God's eyes. I guarantee you there are people in here or watching online today that sincerely believe they come up short in God's eyes. Right now, while I'm talking to you, look at yourself, examine yourself. Are you more conscious of all the sins that you've ever committed and what you're looking at not committing tomorrow and broken fellowship with God, wrongly preached, i.e. self-occupation, are you more focused and aware of the fact of what Jesus did 
Can we put the passion picture of Jesus up? Right there, what Jesus did. Christ occupation. Are you self-occupied? Are you Christ-occupied? Christ died for your sins. That means all your sins are forgiven. Notice God did not say of first importance, look at healing. God did not say of first importance, praise and worship. God did not say of first importance, prayer. He did not say of first importance, a prosperity. Christ's death on the, he said first importance was Christ's death on the cross because of the forgiveness of sins. That's why your prosperity is supposed to be covered because of the forgiveness of sins and the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. <laughs> Second Corinthians 8 and 9. Listen to this. For you are becoming progressively acquainted with and recognizing more strongly Yes, the grace. You're getting grace today. You're hearing about Jesus today. Okay? His undeserved favor. You get spiritual blessing. That though he was very rich, so rich, he supported 12 dudes, three years, who knows how, how much. Uh, okay, Judas is stealing, and they don't even know it. 12 guys. Imagine. Me, Dustin, and all his friends. And Jim's got to take care of them. Uh, okay. How much money would that take? They gambled over his clothes. So he was rich. He, listen to this. He, he, he was rich that though he was very rich, yet for our sake he became poor when he's watching them gambling the last of his possessions before he died. Yet for your sakes he became poor in order that by that, by that happening to him, you could be enriched. And that's not spiritual enrichment. I'm just telling you what the Bible said. Where he became poor at the cross. We good? He became totally destitute of every worldly good he had so that you can receive today. Did you know poverty is a curse? It absolutely is a curse. That's why Jesus said, I came to preach a good news to the poor, and good news to the poor is what? Hang on in this life, and you'll be poorer still. Is that good news? This is not my normal subject. Jesus said in, in so many words, you should have prosperity through my death. He said, seek ye first his righteousness, and you won't worry about material things. In other words, you don't even have to ask. But the main focus really of the whole Bible, if you look at how their sins were atoned for in the old covenant, the whole Bible is about the forgiveness of sins. And how forgiven you are. If you don't understand the extent of your forgiveness of sins, you're, you're going to have trouble walking in prosperity and healing. What I'm getting at here is you have to pay attention to the order in the Bible. I believe there's an order for the blessings, for the New Testament blessings under the new covenant. Ephesians 1.18, we just prayed this last week, okay? By having the eyes of our heart flooded with light so we can know and understand the hope to which we have been called. Now listen, we, you prayed this all together last week. What are we praying? We're praying for wisdom and how rich is his glorious inheritance in the saints. So you're praying to get that inheritance, to get that blessing. You're praying for wisdom to get that blessing, all right? That's what we were doing last week. Last week, we all prayed it together. This is what we're talking about. We're talking about blessing, and I'm trying to convince you there is an order, and whether you believe it or not, an order to certain, there's an order to certain blessings. At least you leave today with forgiveness of sins on your mind, and Father, I just pray they leave with a better relationship with you. And everyone online, you know, we just... I have to say, I'm so glad online that you're tuned in and that you tune in. And even if you live in Brooklyn Park and you can't make it here, you thank you. But I have to say, I'm so, thank you for, for setting your day up to come to church. Do you understand? Thank you for the people that are here today. All right? Thank you for coming. 
And if, I truly believe the extent of forgiveness received from God is the extent of healing you will get from God. The extent of forgiveness you receive from God, I truly believe in these last days, is the extent of healing you will receive or take from him. Luke 5, 17. Notice it says, this is, we've been going over this story. Notice it says, uh, he, was, he was preaching, uh, paraphrasing to a bunch of preachers from all over. Must have been 30 or 40 guys. It must have been a big house. What does it say the last sentence? And the power of the Lord was present to heal what? Them? All of them. Them. Plural. More than one person. More than one person. The power of the Lord was there. Just to let you know, at the end of the story, only one person got healed. Preachers. These guys, I mean, they, like, they would have the equivalent of the New Testament memorized. Like if, if this would be like if you knew, memorized the whole New Testament. These are these guys sitting in there, right? They had the Old Testament memorized. And none of them got healed. They had all this knowledge. The Lord's power was present, and he was preaching. Okay, two quick examples on this order. You can find it in yourself in Acts. Paul was preaching at Lystra, they were non-Christians in the crowd. None of them had Jesus. Paul looked at a man in the crowd, and like Todd White might, right, and said something to the effect, I perceive you can receive your healing. The man stood up. He'd been seriously, physically disabled his entire life and was healed in front of a whole town of non-Christians. And, and to prove they were all non-Christians, they worship Paul as a God on the spot. So they didn't know anything about Jesus. You know a lot more about Jesus than they knew. Another time, Paul preached a really long sermon. They were in a house, and they were in a second story of a house, and a kid was sitting on a window seal, fell asleep and fell out the window seal, landed on the ground, and died. It's never a good idea to sleep in church, especially in the first row of the balcony. Keep in mind, Paul had just preached, who knows, maybe a five-hour sermon, but runs downstairs, lays immediately on top of the kid who had died, and the kid was raised from the dead. I think the New Testament is trying to get something across. Here's the third example. What was going on? You had preaching going on. The power of the Lord was present to heal one out of 40. It was there to heal. Only one out of 40 got it. The Lister guy, they were all non-Christians and was called out. The other guy died. So these people worship some wicked, crazy gods in Lystra. And from the words coming out of Paul's mouth, he'd been disabled all his life. So what do all these have in common? You've got three times, two different preachers, one the son of God, three different situations where there was preaching and then you had a healing. I don't hear laying on hands anywhere. Healed from words. Okay? You can also find in the Gospels in more than one place where the Bible says people came to hear Jesus and they were healed. You get in the order? They came to heal here and they were healed. At Lystra, the man heard and was healed. The kid that was raised from the dead had listened to a four hour sermon. If someone fell out of the balcony, thank God that would never happen, I would send Pastor Dustin to lay on him. It also says in the Gospels, more than one place, Jesus went about in the villages, what's the order? Preaching, teaching, and then healing. Look at the order. We're talking about an order, over and over and order, an order to get blessed. It doesn't say Jesus went around and healed first. They had to hear him. We're talking about hearing the word of Christ, and things are supposed to be happening. And I'm going to start emphasizing this every week. We're trying to get your faith to a point during the sermon by simply hearing that you can take the grace for the healing right now or on your way out or while you're in the Popeye's drive in or maybe down at Captain Hook's and Crystal after church. I don't know where you go. 
but you can receive it. It, it doesn't just have to happen while you're in church. Just from what you heard. You have to believe it, though. Nobody believes this. You can get your healing that is free in the middle of church without anyone praying over you. So as Jesus was teaching all those law preachers of the law, the power of the Lord was present to heal every single one of them from just listening to what he was saying. This gets, this gets overlooked, you know? I don't believe there's a lot of faith for this in the Christian church because it's just not happening. The power of the Lord is present right now. What the Holy Spirit is trying to tell you right now while you're sitting in your seat. There's so many examples of it in the New Testament. Just as many as the laying on of hands. Next week with Robert Madu, the power of the Lord will be present, probably stronger to heal. And he sh I would answer that if it kept ringing. Just see what happens. I would. We're in church right now. Can I take a message? You should just know, okay. When Robert Madu is here, he shouldn't have to talk to you about the power that is in there to take from what he is saying. It doesn't matter if it's Robert Madu, Mac Hammond, James Tan, it doesn't matter. Or if you're running a life group with nine people preaching a 30-minute message, you can receive your healing. Amen. But when Jesus was preaching to the Pharisees, only one got it. It was at the home of somebody, a nice home, so who, who's probably 20 to 30 people, and one person got healed. This is the Son of God. Don't you think he would have done all of them? Can we put the sculpture of Jesus up? This is what really happened to him. He didn't have him on a pillow. He wasn't wearing a loincloth. He wasn't, he was unrecognizable. They could see his bones in his ribs. He said it in Psalms. He could count my bones because the whip ripping through him. But we know, I've, I've never seen a meeting and I've been to thousands of them where everyone receives their healing. Have you? No. Maybe in 1979 when the church had 12 people and I was running the overview overhead projector. <laughs> but people blame God. God, God, you don't heal me. You, you, you didn't give me my healing. Or, or <laughs> when we, were, we, we lost the last game this year, I forgot the fact that, that, that in the season was over, the game before, we were down by 11 with four minutes, and he gave me a miracle for a win. And the game before that, we played a really bad team, played really bad, and we still won, barely. But then we get into that last game, and we lose by 38, and I'm mad at God because I forgot how, that he got me there, that, that, that he got me all the way there. Maybe I didn't deserve to be there. Maybe he got me farther than I should have been. Maybe it was grace where I was. <laughs> you, f you forget real quick what he brought you through. The Bible says the Father gave us the Holy Spirit that we might know we're freely forgiven. That things, blessing comes free. We don't think that. It means that doesn't cost anything. We're talking about blessings that are free to us. Put the sculpture up again. But it cost God his only son. He only had one son. It cost Jesus his life's blood. No, God freely gave you healing right there in your seat. But you have not freely taken it from him. Romans, they didn't. Think about it. The lady got it, right, what, that washed his feet with her hair, yeah. and all the preachers didn't. What's it tell you? Romans 8, 32. It's proof that it's free. 
He who did not withhold or spare even his own son, but gave him up for us all, will he not also with Jesus freely, free, graciously give us all other things? Let's go to verse 33 in the Amplified. Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who shall come forward and accuse or impeach those who God has chosen? Will God? Look, look at that. Who acquits us? You're acquitted. Better than acquittal, technically. Look, look, let's look at verse 33 in the King James. Look at the le- last word. You're justified. That's why it's free. Because you're, ju- you're not guilty. That's what justified means. You're not just acquitted. You are not guilty. Amen. Not guilty. Not guilty. You are not guilty. I said... Can you bring it down a little? Is that as far as it goes? Hey. You are not guilty. I said not guilty. It's all free. It costs nothing. Nothing. Online, if this is annoying you, give me a frowny face. Otherwise, give me a heart, okay? Jesus actually said, freely, freely give. You have received. Past tense. It's one thing for God to be giving, and it's one thing for you to be taking from him. Taking from him. You know, you say, Jim, well, people don't receive their healing. They don't take their healing. Why is that? In my opinion, people are too busy behaving. Doing this and doing that. Doing this and doing that. I have to say this. I'm against sin. I'm not for sin. I'm not saying let's all go sin. I'm not saying after the service, go pick your favorite sin and let's go do it. That's not what I'm saying. People in the church across America are too busy trying to earn the blessings of healing and prosperity instead of receiving the blessing that is free. Free. We just read it. All things. It said all. All. That covers finances. That covers healing. It's free. Dispute it then. Whatever the reason people are not receiving, don't you agree? Even with the anointing of a Todd White. I mean, people are, people do receive, right? We want higher percentages, correct? With an anointing like Todd White, wouldn't you think 20 wheelchairs? I'm not discounting what God's done. I'm just saying he's coming. You receive from his words alone. He shouldn't even have to call you out. Just because you attend church doesn't mean you automatically receive. If God can force someone to be healed, he can force them to be saved. God's going to lead you beside the steel waters, but he's not going to push your head in the water so you can drink it. Put on your bathing suit so you can swim in it. Nah, he'll lead you. When a healing anointing comes into town, you you should be just looking for his words to to, to just touch you. It's it. Not everyone got saved in the Billy Graham meetings. Think about this. A lot did, but I'm sure people walked out not saved. My point is not who's, you know, the person right next to you could be taking what they need right now. And then there's people that just aren't. So we're working on an order. We got a lot of things going in this series. It's an order of blessing. It's a sub point and an outline. And in my opinion, it all comes back to the forgiveness of sins. 2 Peter 1, 2, this is our main text. All, All the whole series May grace, what's that? Favor, favor, you study it out, you don't deserve, okay? Which is, and peace, which is all all kinds of peace. Perfect well-being. How many times a day is like, perfect well-being, all right. (laughs) Hit that spot. Perfect well-being. Freedom from fear, period, any kind of fear. 
agitating passions and you have freedom from moral calm, that's a lot of peace. That you can, it can be multiplied. That kind of peace and that kind of grace can be multiplied. See, that means everybody doesn't get the same, okay? You can get grace times one or grace times 30 that you don't deserve. But the key is you got to know you don't deserve it, no matter how good you are. But Jesus deserves it. See, what gets you that grace? Look at, the, look at the last sentence. The knowledge of God. You're getting knowledge. See, you, if you receive it and you have faith for it, you're getting it right now. You're getting knowledge on Jesus. Right? But then it says that that knowledge can be disrupted. It hasn't made it yet. Listen to what, what it says. For this reason, it says, add to your diligence... Adding your diligence, employ every effort, exercising, we're talking about exercising your faith when you speak to the weather, whether if you believe it or not, you're exercising your faith. People are just smiling. Okay, Jim, you keep speaking. Yeah, you'll be calling me in 10 days when it's still 90. Okay? <laughs> All right? Look, virtue, develop virtue, that's, that's moral character. Um, uh, from there, you develop self-control. Self-control, patience. These are fruits of the Spirit. And then godliness. And that's devotion to God, right? Then brotherly affection. And then from there, once you can, ex- you know, there, there's, there's a list here. And I just, I'm only good for like half these, right? Missing self-control with food and speeding. <laughs> I have a temper. I'm not patient at all. I mean, you, you can read it like that if you want. Look, 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 this is what it says in verse 8. If these qualities are yours and increasingly abounding, they will keep you from being unfruitful in your faith. Listen, verse 9. For Jim Hammond and the other four people in here, whoever lacks these qualities, all those qualities we just read, right? You're blind. But you know what it says? The only reason in the New Testament it's saying you don't have moral character, the only reason it's saying you don't have self-restraint, it's saying that you don't have patience, it's saying you don't have brotherly love, it's saying you don't have Christian love or devotion to God, you have forgotten your sins were forgiven. Only reason. It says it. You see it? He forgot the fact that he was cleansed from his old sins. Any of those things missing in your life, healings missing in your life, I would say if healing is forgotten that your sins are forgiven somewhere. What do you mean by that? Well, somewhere I am condemned for something that I did. Somewhere I feel heavy guilt, and it might be to the point of shame. So when you get that, and that comes in on you, whether it's a type of oppression or depression, you actually start to act it out. You have to forgive yourself. If you, if you don't... If, you're never going to forgive yourself if you don't receive this forgiveness from God. You can talk to all the shrinks you want. I've talked to plenty of them myself. <laughs> Sorry for that word. It's probably politically incorrect, isn't it? Okay. <laughs> Remember when Jesus was teaching to all those teachers of the law, coming back to this story. The only one that got her healing was the lady who was the worst acting of all of them, a possible prostitute. She got healed. He said it because she knew how forgiven she was. She she did. He told those other preachers, you think you've been forgiven so little. That's your problem. That's really what he was saying. She knows she needs forgiveness, and she got it, and she got her healing. That's why there was only one healing. Now, let's close with this. You know, we went through all those characteristics, and then it said, it hit you with, if you can't do one of those or half of those, and you're not bounding in those, and you're not growing in those, somewhere you have forgotten your sins were forgiven, okay? And then you know what he says just like three verses later? And verse 12, I intend always to remind you about these things. That means you need to be reminded. Okay? That that, that you need, although indeed you know them, you know you're forgiven, right? But you don't know it's a 
the first importance. Indeed, you, he's going to remind you. Peter is telling them you need to be reminded about forgiveness of your sins on a regular basis because you will forget it. We conclude the day, and I just want to say the extent that you know you're forgiven by God is the extent that you will receive healing. Can I speak something? Can we speak something together? Can we close before I hand it over to Dustin? Um, now remember, now you have a different take on what you're saying, right? What you're hearing, what you're hearing other people say. Charles Cap said, it's better to speak it out loud so you can hear yourself say it. Amen. So let's do this. Yeah. this. This could be the only thing you need to do. For what? For, for that child, for that child to come back, huh? That you has, have not seen in however many years, you know? God can send them a labor all day long. We have to ask them, okay? You guys ready? This is out of, these are out of a book Mark Hankins wrote called Bloodline of a Champion. Been having requests for these, so let's... Can we do it all together on three as we close? Ready? One, two, three. The blood of Jesus cleanses me from sin in all its forms and manifestations. I win my case because I plead the blood of Jesus. I plead the blood of Jesus over my family, over my past, over my future, and over my conscience. When I plead the blood of Jesus, I am not guilty. God blots out my sins, and he will not remember them. That's a scripture. We overcome the enemy by the supernatural weapon of the blood of Jesus Christ. Did they not get that up? Oh, let's all do that again. Ready? We, oh, this is a big one. We overcome the enemy by the supernatural weapon of the blood of Jesus. By the blood of Jesus Christ, I enter into perfect communion with God. We boldly confess that through the blood of Jesus, we are healed in our minds, our wills, our emotions, and our bodies. We are blessed with Abraham's blessings of prosperity and health because of the blood of Jesus. We honor the blood of Jesus today. And give the Holy Spirit freedom to move in every area of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. It was an honor being here with you today.